The Lord be with you. And grace and peace to you on this second Sunday of Advent and worship here at First Presbyterian Church in downtown Racine. We're glad you could join us. In addition to being the second Sunday of Advent, it's the first Sunday of the month. And so we also have communion prepared and we want you to take a moment, if you haven't already, to prepare some bread, some wine, some juice, so you can participate and share together virtually uh, in communion today. Also on the first Sunday of each month, it is the custom here to sing happy birthday. So before the poem, before we light the Advent candle, uh, we want to take a moment to wish a happy birthday, to sing happy birthday for all those celebrating December birthdays. One last commercial. Be sure to check our webpage, firstpresracine.org, for Bible studies, prayers. Also, if you Zoom in at 9.30 on Sundays, you can stay after worship and join a breakout group and have a bit of fellowship, which is especially helpful during this Advent time. We hope you then will stay and join your fellow worshipers for a little bit of fellowship. And now, let us sing Happy Birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday and God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Making Peace by Denise Levertoff. A voice from the dark called out, The poets must give us imagination of peace to oust the intense, familiar imagination of disaster. Peace, not only the absence of war. But peace, like a poem, is not there ahead of itself, can't be imagined before it is made, can't be known except in the words of its making. Grammar of justice, syntax of mutual aid. A feeling towards it, dimly sensing a rhythm, is all we have until we begin to utter its metaphors, learning them as we speak. A line of peace might appear if we restructured the sentence our lives are making, revoked its reaffirmation of profit and power, questioned our needs, allowed long pauses. A cadence of peace might balance its weight on that different fulcrum. Peace, a presence, an energy field more intense than war, might pulse then, stanza by stanza, into the world, each act of living one of its words, each word a vibration of light, facets of the forming crystal. Second Sunday of Advent. On the second Sunday of Advent, we light this candle, the candle of peace. We join people throughout, with people throughout the world to watch and wait for the coming of the Prince of Peace. When Jesus was born, the angels sang of peace on earth and goodwill to all people. Let us commit our lives to working for peace on earth, and may we be generous in showing goodwill to all.
Please join me in the prayer of confession. O holy God of promise, you come to show us the way of love, yet we continue to love only what we deem lovely and care for what we name as ours. Help us to see others as you do, as beloved children of God. Forgive our selfishness and guide us to serve the poor, the lonely, those who are marginalized and all in need. In your mercy, forgive us for the ways we fall short. Renew our spirits and enable us to go into the world with love, offering our gifts and sharing our talents that we might be an answer to someone's prayer. We offer these prayers in the name of your Son, Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. The assurance of pardon. Hear the good news. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Know that the spirit of the risen Christ inspirits you and rejoice. Amen. Passing of the peace. Since God has made us the blessed community, the church, let us greet one another in whatever way we can with the peace and joy of Christ. Peace and joy be with you and also with you. Our Bible reading today is from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1 through 11. Comfort, O comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up. 
and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice cries out, and I say, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord will stand forever. Get you up on a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judea, here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs of his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. Our gospel reading for the second Sunday of Advent is from the gospel according to St. Mark. Listen for the word of God. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Our reading for this second Sunday of Advent. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. John's message is clear and emphatic. Repent. I'll let you in on a little secret. Sometimes repentance is relatively easy. There was a young girl, a teenager, we'll name her Betty, who started running with a rough crowd. She got into drinking, drugs, a little bit of uh, shoplifting, some vandalism, started adopting a tood, an attitude. Parents were very concerned, grandparents very concerned, teachers all trying to work with her. She was, one day she realized that everyone who saw her was somewhat disgusted by her, afraid. She alienated people who, had, who loved her. And as she looked at her future, if she kept going the way she was, eventually she would get caught and get into ever deeper trouble. Seeing that future, seeing the look of disgust and fear in the eyes of people who cared about her was a tipping point. She began to change. What surprised her is that it was easier than she thought it would be. She had no longer any guilt about anything she was doing, no fear of being caught. She could now look in the eyes of family and teachers and friends and see welcome and trust and affection again. All of that was very healing for her. The more she changed in that direction, the better it became. She was encouraged to use her considerable talents not to dismiss and demean and be rude, but to use them creatively. And as she did, she experienced something she hadn't in a long time, joy. Sometimes repentance is easy. As easy as deciding that these clothes really don't fit and it's time to let them go. 
But sometimes repentance is difficult and it may be the most painful thing one can do. Recall the story of Simon Peter at the crucifixion of Jesus. He has just promised that no matter what happens and if everyone else falls away, he will stand with Jesus. He will not fail his best friend. And yet, when Jesus is taken, Simon runs away, stays in the courtyard, and then denies Jesus three times. Jesus is being mocked and beaten and sent to be tortured to death on a cross. And not only does Peter do nothing to stop it, doesn't try to stand by his friend. Even more, he curses that he would even be associated with this Jesus. Imagine his shame, his self-loathing. He learns that Jesus is alive. He wants desperately to see him, and yet shame holds him back. He thinks it's better to die of shame than to see the hurt in Jesus' eyes at Peter's betrayal, to be betrayed by your best friend. Much easier to give in to the belief that Jesus could never forgive him, much less ever trust him again. Lose hope the way Judas did. Repentance can be relatively easy or it can be the most difficult thing we will ever do. But fundamental to the question is the question, why repent? To repent, the word repent means to turn from. Initially, we are disgusted at what we are doing, appalled at what we are becoming. Maybe we see ourselves reflected in the eyes of people we admire, our parents, our grandparents, a mentor. We see us reflected in the eyes of people we love, their disappointment, their worry, and we are ashamed. Or maybe we feel lost. We have just gone along with the crowd doing what most everyone else seems to be doing, having no purpose greater than just getting along and being comfortable. We realize that we've never stood up for anything, never risked taking a stand for anyone or anything. Our dreams have all been just shallow. Our efforts are without risk and we feel empty. All this life that is ours and we have not used it for anything but pleasure. Repentance is usually motivated by disgust or a sense of being lost or a combination of the two. But repentance that leads to life is sustained by hope. A hope inspired by wonder that there could be something so much greater. If we are motivated to repent by what we turn from, we are sustained in our efforts to change by what or who we turn to. Israel finally was disgusted by what they had become. The prophets had railed at them to say, look at yourselves. Look at what you've become. Thieves, murderers, all you want to do is dominate others and you'll use any means, no matter how moral, immoral, to do it. They cheated the poor so they could take their land and then, insult upon insult, enslaved the people, the very people whose land they had just stolen. And most horrific, they had begun to take up the practice of child sacrifice as the nations around them were doing. Disgust got them to repent. But it was wonder that sustained their transformation. Isaiah said to them, God has told me to speak to you words of comfort. Comfort my people. Tell them, behold, your God comes. He comes to you, not in anger, not in punishment, not in wrath, but to lead you home as a shepherd leads mother sheep with newborn lambs. How could this be? 
Here was the God who loved them and tried to teach them the ways of life and they had rejected this God. They had done everything shameful they could imagine. They had grown stubborn, refused to listen, much less follow God. And with deep sadness, God had left them to the consequences of their choices. And then, when they had profaned everything, lost everything of value that God had given them, destroyed the very image of what they were meant to be, God comes to take them back. God lets them learn from their mistakes, but God does not abandon or shame them. Working now with their contrite hearts, God patiently begins to form, reform them into a holy people, make them a light to the nations. Repent, John the baptizer says, turn from all that is death, turn to God who is life. Repentance will be different for each of us. For some, it will be relatively easy. And for others, it will be difficult, even painful. We are likely to begin with a turning from, turning from a destructive path or an abyss of meaninglessness and purposelessness. But more, so much more than turning from, is turning to. Almost in an instant, we glimpse life and ourselves as we were meant to be, life in its fullness. The moment now is charged with the spark of the eternal. As Gerard Manley Hopkins wrote, the world is charged with the grandeur of God, and in a moment, we get a glimpse of it and ourselves in it. Like one dying of thirst who sees at last a fountain of clear, cold water, we run, discarding anything that holds us back. Joy lifting our feet. God is life. Comfort, O oh, comfort my people, O oh, Jerusalem, herald of good tidings, say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Amen. Yeah. 
gates of the past to the end of the age to be. Your very name puts the proud to shame and do those who would for you yearn. You will show your might, put the strong to fight, for the world is about to turn. My heart shall sing of the day you bring, let the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near, and the world is about to
Hear the words of our Lord Jesus. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and, lo, I am with you always, even to the close of the age. Hear also these words from Holy Scripture. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and creator of us all, who is above all and through all and in all. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, for we are all one in Christ. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of one who has called you out of darkness into God's marvelous light. Obeying the word of our Lord Jesus and confident of his promises, we baptize those whom God has called. In baptism, God claims us and seals us to show that we belong to God. God frees us from sin and death, uniting us with Christ in his death and resurrection. By the water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, the body of Christ, and joined into Christ's ministry of love, peace, and justice. Let us remember with joy our own baptism as we celebrate this sacrament. On behalf of the session, I present Julian Michael Grunewald, son of Amanda and Michael Grunewald, to receive the sacrament of baptism. Do you desire that Julian be baptized? Relying on God's grace, do you promise to live the Christian faith and teach that faith to your child? Larissa, Andrew, and Suzanne, do you promise through prayer and example to support and encourage Julian to be a faithful Christian? If so, say, we do. Do you, members of the Church of Jesus Christ, promise to guide and nurture Julian by word and deed, with love and prayer, encouraging him to know and follow Christ and to be a faithful member of Christ's church. If so, answer we do. We thank you, Almighty God, for the gift of water. Over it, the Holy Spirit moved in the beginning of creation. Through it, you led the children of Israel out of their bondage in Egypt into the land of promise. In it, your son Jesus received the baptism of John and was anointed by the Holy Spirit as the Messiah, the Christ, to lead us through his death and resurrection from the bondage of sin into everlasting life. We thank you for the water of baptism. In it we are buried with Christ in his death. By it we share in his resurrection. Through it we are reborn by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in joyful obedience to your Son, we bring into his fellowship those who come to him in faith, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Now sanctify this water, we pray you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that those here who are cleansed from sin and born anew may continue forever in the risen Christ. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be all glory and honor now and forever. Amen. What name do you give your son? Hand out there. Julian Michael, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. See what love is for us that we should be called the children of God, and so we are. There's one of your godparents waving to you right there. And this is the rest of family, a cousin, look at that, there, if you hold them for just a minute, Julian Mark Michael, you are marked as God's own forever, in the name of the Father.
Through his baptism, Julian has been received into the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. As a member of the household of God, God has called him to serve Christ in the world. Let us welcome him to this ministry. With joy and thanksgiving, we welcome you into Christ's church, for we are all one in Christ. We promise to love, encourage, and support you, and to share the good news of the gospel with you, and to help you know and follow Christ. Amen. Welcome. We come to our time for our offering. We invite you to help us continue these broadcasts, these services for you, and also to help us continue to minister to the neediest in our own community, those who are struggling because of this COVID virus. So with this spirit of Advent, a spirit of hopefulness, let us bring our tithes and our offerings. Christ comes with bread and wine and invites us, all of us, to join him. So let us come to his table with our spirits, if not with our bodies, where Christ himself turns strangers into neighbors and even enemies into friends. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. 
O Lord our God, creator and ruler of the universe, you formed us in your image and set us in this world to love, serve, and enjoy you and to live in peace with your whole creation. But we have not lived up to your hope or our promise. So you sent prophets to call us back to your way. Then in the fullness of time, you sent your only son, Jesus, Emmanuel, to be one of us, to redeem, heal, and inspirit us. Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and this wine and joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming. We give thanks that our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and blessed and broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body given for you. And in the same manner, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood. Jesus said, Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, do this in remembrance of me. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all who share this feast. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world, through Christ, with Christ, in Christ. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. At this time, we invite you, wherever you are, to take the bread, and if you are with others, serve one another, saying, the body of Christ and then serve the juice or the wine, saying the cup of the new covenant. Let us now participate in this sacrament which Jesus has given us.
And now the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day, this night, and forever. Amen.